Hello, everyone. Uh, today, my guest is Marcel Mordarski, uh, a physicist, researcher in quantum mechanics and quantum computing, uh, University of Cambridge, and now Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan. Uh, thank you very much, Marcel, for accepting my invitation. My pleasure. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here with Maciej. And we will talk about all things quantum today. So, yes, so that's pre pretty, pretty scary. <laughs> Is it scary, really? Uh, I I know that it's been Halloween yesterday, but it's not really scary. It's just science. It's just science, true. Uh, it's like uh, I, I I joke that it's scary because we hear all the time about you know quantum this, quantum that, and today. Uh, we would like to demystify all these things. Uh, yes, I'll be your demystifier, and let's let's make people not fear about that anymore. Let's make people interested about that. Exactly. So let's start with the famous quote from Richard Feynman: uh, "That to solve quantum problems, uh, we need quantum uh, solutions." So, in fact, do we need do we need quantum computing? to solve, let's say, the biggest mysteries uh, of the world we, we live in? Well, I guess that um, to answer this question properly, uh, I would have to give some background on Feynman, even though I guess most of the people have heard about them um, to a certain extent. Um, he's a famous physicist, a Nobel laureate, um, known for his uh, humorous approach to life. and. I'd say whenever Feynman says something, he he's cheeky. He wants to joke a bit. Um, and maybe he was just trying to be provocative with this particular statement. Because uh, I remember re reading his lecture, which is called Simulating Physics with Computers, which I believe this quote um, originates from. And um, he says, oh, this is supposed to be the main event today. That's the seminal talk that I'm supposed to uh, give the keynote address. And it's not going to be so because I don't know what a keynote address is. Um, and he keeps this sort of frivolous um, mood throughout the lecture. Um, saying that, oh no, 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 that I, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. Let's let's not treat it too seriously. But um in the field of nanotechnology, he gave a similar seminal lecture that I really encourage you to read about. Uh, it's called um, There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, which is about manipulating individual atoms from one place to another to form patterns. Um devices uh, and other useful structures on the nanoscale. And that lecture went unnoticed for almost 20 years. Only in the 1980s, people started digging up um, and they said, oh, if Feynman said so, that, that must be true. Uh, and I'd say this is similar case. I, I would say that um, he was trying to be cheeky, but in fact, he did mean it. And as, it, as per my own view, uh, I think two contexts are quite important to understand what he means by it. One is purely philosophical, the other is actually experimental. Uh, and I'd like to briefly talk you through uh, both of these points of view. So um, there is this famous, also counterintuitive uh, theorem in mathematics called the Gödel's incompleteness theorem that um, primarily deals with the limitations of mathematics and the formal systems um, that describe it. Um, and it says that if we've got a formal system, I I'm leaving aside what it means, uh, that can express some basic arithmetics there exists true mathematical statements that cannot be proven within that system. And how does it relate to quantum mechanics? Uh, in the following way, quantum mechanics can be thought to be one of these systems. If we approach our reality that has been proven so many times to be quantum, with something that is less, um, less expressive, weaker than quantum mechanics, we're probably not arriving at any reasonable conclusion at the deepest level of understanding. 
Um, I think that um, quantum has to deal with quantum to approach the frontier, to, to have the power to actually scratch it. Um, and the other reason that I think this is actually true comes from the recent history of quantum computing. Um, famous um, computer scientist I'd call, but maybe he's a physicist and um, he will not be happy about me calling him a computer scientist. Peter Shaw, who, mm, who's the author of the famous Shaw's algorithm, um, had to completely rethink the way he approached the problem. Um, his algorithm serves the purpose of factorizing big numbers into primes. This has very serious implications in the um, security systems. And he was pondering how to do it. And while, while having these thoughts, um, he rediscovered a piece of mathematical trivia, a theorem that said that any number and, there, and that there is a function that applied to any number can give a um, period of, um, sorry, uh, I'm messing it up. There is a function um, that uh, can ascribe certain properties to every number. And through that, one can um, actually work out which prime numbers it corresponds to. And if we had to use that approach on a classical computer, we would spend hours. It's completely rubbish. There is no way uh, one would actually be successful in factorizing numbers uh, with this approach. Yet in quantum, it works. And with that thought, I, I think Feynman was actually right. So maybe let's, let's move very down to earth now. Uh, Sorry, how, yeah, I started from a, from a high No, no it was fantastic. It's just, let's say, how are we really, how far are we really advanced in creating a, a quantum hardware? Well, there already exists some quantum hardware and um, it's been successfully used for certain purposes. Um, it depends on the platform. It depends on um, on the application. It's often the case that we could actually use the hardware uh, for certain problems, but only for a limited range of uh, values. Um, it's hard to predict, and I don't want to reiterate points made by scientists that are much more um, knowledgeable about the topic than I am, but I, I'd say a decade is, is a minimum time of uh, having something that can actually leverage advantage on a global scale, because we are already using plenty of quantum stuff um, that changes our life. But for everyone to hear about that at least once, it's at least 1,000, 2,000 qubits, uh, and we are quite far away from that. Although this weekend, uh, I think there was a news report that one of the quantum startups actually broke that threshold of 1,000 qubits. We'll see if, uh, if they are successful. So comparing it to the development of computers, are we at the stage of Turing machine, of the, at the stage of the first computers, or have we reached transistor level so far in your opinion? Mm. Um, I'd say transistor level would be when we're absolutely sure about the scalability and reproducibility and um, assembling qubits. And for those listeners who, who are afraid of that word, qubit is a, a quantum version of a bit. Um, so the basic um, unit of information in, in quantum computing. Um, so I'd say we we are at the beginning, and this is quite an exciting time to be a quantum physicist. Right, so we, we, we didn't speak about, let's say, uh, quantum computing in general. Uh, for those uh, who want to get to know the basics, uh, in an hour I introduce uh, my episode with Pavel Gora. Uh, I will link it. But basically, um, Qubits are, are units of information, which are, uh, how to say, uh, some level of probability. 
Uh, mm -hmm. put, yeah, put, that's put, absolutely put, 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 right. Put, yeah. Very generally, uh, instead of you know being a, a finite uh, value mm, like one or zero, which is a bit, uh, qubit is is a degree of probability, so to say. Between these values, yes, that's, Between that's these absolutely values. correct. So that's why uh, quantum computers are so much faster than traditional ones. Uh, plus, uh, because uh, there is a, a phenomenon called entanglement. So maybe you could uh, go on just a little bit what entanglement is. Sure. Um, entanglement is a property of certain systems um, that they affect uh, well, changes in one part of the system affect um, the other part of the system instantaneously. Um, on the mathematical level, um, it can be described as a system that can be decomposed through a tensor product into simpler um, simpler entities. So, and, basically... Yeah, interestingly enough, entanglement is treated as a resource. And quantum computation, this is the actual uh, material that we can use to uh, perform jobs, to perform um, tasks, uh, to do simulations uh, in various contexts. So these two phenomena, uh, that uh, qubit is not uh, finite, uh, or finite, I don't know the correct pronunciation, uh, and... Uh, and entanglement so that the qubits can be um just put, interdependent put, that, yeah that's exactly that that makes that makes quantum computing so much faster than, than traditional computing and plenty of right people that have come up with plenty of algorithms to actually harness these um these resources and put them to work so I've just come across uh, a book that I recommend to everyone, uh, The Coming Way by Mustafa Suleiman, who is one of the founders of DeepMind. DeepMind is, for those who, who don't know DeepMind, DeepMind is a, a London startup, if, if, if you can say a multi-billion uh, dollar company a startup. Uh, They've been overtaken by Google already, over so they're not a startup anymore. But yeah, they're, they're a very cool company. Uh, and yes, they they were they were they were overtaken by Google. Um, so I think Mustafa Suleiman is, has already left DeepMind and Google as well, and started something on his own again. And anyway, uh, the book is about the 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 intersection of. Uh, machine learning, I prefer this term than artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and synthetic biology. But this is a, a massive breakthrough. Uh, in... so, uh, I guess we're going to unpack what, what he meant by this uh, wave in today's episode. Yes, so uh, let's say how much, uh, because we are at, at the forefront, I would say, of a revolution created by synthetic biology. Uh, everyone's into machine learning, which is all the rage now. Uh, quantum computing is less known, but still, let's say, technology fans uh, already know quite some about it. Uh, the question remains, uh, how? what happens when we, let's say, uh, when we join uh, synthetic biology into this? Can, can, can we expect, can we ever await? What, what would be your take, Marcel? What would be my take? Um, so I'm not a biologist. I can't really comment on, 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 on the variety of problems that uh, these people face. Uh, I'm sure that uh, just through my rudimentary understanding of what biologists do, we've got plenty of overlap to collaborate on. Um, and I'd say that um, obviously quantum uh, quantum computing is projected to impact many different areas of technology of our lives. 
Um, but the most immediate ones that I can see is um, the improvement of simulations, which uh, can be applied anywhere, in particular in, in biology, in drug research. Um, and while I can't comment on whether it will be very useful to sequence certain genes or maybe some other properties, uh, I'm, I'm sure that we can create plenty of subroutines for other methods that will be quite impactful for, for biology. Could I promise you anything in terms of uh, deliverables? Uh, I'm thinking we could definitely work on better drugs. We could um, definitely understand better uh, processes like binding of uh, drugs or molecules within the body. Um, could we analyze data better? Uh, this is another area that uh, I think will be quite impacted by uh, quantum machine learning or or just quantum algorithms. Right, and 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 in medicine, so far it's probably with with the current state of computing, it would be difficult, at least from from what I talked to people and from what I read, uh, to create a, a digital twin of a whole body of a whole human organism. Uh, um, actually, there is so uh, it's good to, that you've introduced um, DeepMind because uh, the name is absolutely not coincidental. They they think that we can scratch and, and dig dig in deeper in our understanding of what mind is with with machine learning and with quantum computers. Mm. I I would rule out for now um, the possibility of actual copy, not because we, we wouldn't be necessarily unable to do it. There are certain people working on vitrification of brain and then scanning it slice by slice. Um, what I would say is that we, we don't have possess the full control of uh, uh, expression of the data that we, we would be able to, um, to gather. What quantum computing can actually help us do, and I've worked on that a bit, um, is to reproduce the complexity of human mind. So um, there would still, it's highly speculative what I'm saying, but um, there are certain problems in physics, like spin glass physics, uh, that was actually um, the um, uh, area that was awarded the Nobel Prize in um, 2021 that when combined with neuroscience and with physics could help us to build something as complex as human brain. I don't remember how many firings of neurons uh, we can experience every second, but this is an enormous number. And billions or whatever. Like, uh, billions, yeah. it's, it's just, let's say, uh, a uh, huge, huge number. Um, it's, it's, it's really mental. Yes, and um, what I would you know, suggest people read about in terms of this topic is how complex systems in physics, let's say glass, um, so glass that you, you've got in your windows, um, interact with each other and how we can quantumly describe them, uh, possibly applying it to some, something completely unrelated. This interdisciplinarity is at the core of, of what we could do in if we invested more in quantum research. Uh, by the way, glass is, is, is a big miracle uh, still how it's, uh, how it's, how it's being done. Uh, I, I've heard some well-known physicists that let's say it's, it's coming from a solid state to a, to a liquid, something coming to, from, a, from a solid state to a liquid state is still uh, definitely not obvious. Even, even. Yes, space transitions are, are quite incredible. And I've had the opportunity of working with Professor Stephen Bramwell from UCL, um, who, who had plenty of expertise on that topic. He, he was actually the one, and this shows how counterintuitive um, research on certain topics is. He, um, he also investigated eyes um are actually spin eyes and he proved that um, by certain definition there may exist a magnetic monopole so you know when you play with magnets it always um is also 
somewhat tricky. They, they like to align themselves according to the lines of the magnetic field because they are loops. They, they can't just start off. Yet he proved that in certain conditions, under certain definitions, this is possible. Well, wow. Yes, this is, this is that, that was my reaction when I first heard about that, and and I knew that I wanted to work with him. It always amazes me when I talk to physicists uh, how little do we still know about the world around us, or that we we're still rediscovering it. But now a word of caution: like we, uh, I try to be enthusiastic about what I do, and. You can expectedly um, see that uh, I do try to share some quantum agenda that may actually be be proven wrong in in some time, but that's science. Um, what I wanted to say is that um, obviously there are problems that quantum computers wouldn't um, deal with so efficiently, like big sets of data. There and the best um, search algorithm that we've got, the Grover's, Grover's algorithm, just uh, gives a square root advantage over classical methods. It means that um, if we just mm, uh, well square the number and the size of the system, we are at the starting point, and this is a limitation. And on your point that physics is so miraculous and we still learn very little. Um, that that's true that's that's the reason i'm doing it but um let me quote professor we know Meisner. Quite enough as well right this is well sorry we we, we we know quite enough though <laughs> for certain applications yes and this is because uh, as professor meisner from the university of warsaw once said physics is a very simple science and it's simple because it can just deal with simple systems Biology, this is beyond my understanding and complexity, complexity that um, it shows it gives rise to is far beyond the understanding of um, of an average physicist and our average knowledge at the time. Yeah, glad you mentioned biology because I wanted to, to ask you, let's say, three questions uh, mm -hmm. that I uh, about problems I learned from a book mm -hmm. by Michio Kaku. Uh, a famous physicist and physics sure. propagator. Uh, let's say that what quantum can solve, so one of them relating to biology, we do not understand photosynthesis so far. Like quantum help us to understand photosynthesis and, and the origin of life. Um, I'm quite sure that with... Um, so first of all, we sort of understand photosynthesis. It's just that we don't understand it enough. What um, at most quantum could do is just improve this understanding a bit. Um, what I would say, um, as I said before, the first area of application that quantum may experience and certain companies like Continuum already proved that, um, is that quantum simulations will be the first um, area of application. Uh, photosynthesis is just a conversion of, of solar um, of light into energy um, in a way very similar to what we are um, we're using in photovoltaics. Um, my, my main answer, and we can delve into algorithms and how they do it, um, is that with um, enough of resources like qubits and entanglement and uh, coherence, um, we will be able to simulate many, many different versions of the same scenario. For now, we're sort of at this playground level where we've got certain parameters, uh, we just run them on our computers, and we're not sure um, if the parameters chosen are always the best. With quantum computers, we'll be able to simultaneously um, analyze very many sets of different scenarios. And this obviously helps with photosynthesis and other biological processes. Carbon emission. Carbon emission. Um, all right, let's let's change the way we we've been talking about that. Um, now I'm working on, on this interesting algorithm um, that is used to solve 
solve, and here is a um, quote unquote, um, systems of equations. Um, the way to tackle carbon, uh, the reduction of unwanted carbon emission um, is, is quite diverse. There are people working on the storage and capture of um, CO2, but there are also people working, let's say, in um, plane companies or airlines on the optimization of travel. Um, if I was to choose which one would be affected by quantum computing, it'd be definitely optimization. And the algorithm that I'm working on um, is precisely the reason why. Why? Because it gives, um, by considering the same problem formulated in the quantum way, a different estimate. Um, that's the beauty of quantum computing. Not only um, do these computers have an advanced way of storing information, it's much more compressed. And that's what allows for um, speed up in algorithms. For example, if, if you're interested, I do recommend reading about quantum random access memory. So the quantum version of the memories we've got in, in our computers. Um, and because its structure is logarithmically uh, more efficient than the random access memory, we can use different, different um, algorithms. Right. Uh, and last one, I, I've read that, let's say, uh, the car industry is investing quite heavily in, in quantum nowadays. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say, how, how, how does it relate to, to making more efficient batteries, for, for instance? Uh, as I said, this um, more, is the main challenge. More efficient batteries. Um, I'd say it's, again, the simulation that we've got, but um, there is also a huge part of quantum research that wouldn't necessarily be qualified as quantum computing. Um, and I do have to give some justice to, to my fellow scientists that uh, work on on other um, uses of quantum technology in our lives. Um, in terms of batteries, obviously all the mechanisms that I've already described, like improved search, improved uh, simulations, uh, would be applicable. But um, when it comes to batteries, there is also plenty of sensing. Uh, we have to, um, for example, know um, how the energy is used in cars or in batteries, and with quantum, we can do that better. Right. Marcel, thank you so much for, for uh, demystifying uh, all these topics. Uh, it's just uh, great to, to get to know it instead of, you know, reading about quantum psychology or quantum yoga, uh, <laughs> which, which, which also happens. There are no such things uh, we can confirm. Maybe. Well, you, you have to give me some book recommendations. I have to expand <laughs> my knowledge on the ones. Uh, you have a wonderful gift of presenting all this complicated stuff in a really, uh, uh, really clear and approachable way. Uh, so well, if anyone has any questions, please email them to me. I hope that uh, you can find me on social media or uh, contact me some some other way. I'm always up for a chat and. Uh, maybe I'll be a bit more clear than this time. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, uh, it was a it was a wonderful explanation and a, and a great talk. So, thank you so much and happy to see you again on the on the, on the show. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to Sherpa Search on Tech. If you have enjoyed the show, please subscribe to our show wherever you listen. Thanks again. The Sherpa Search on Tech podcast is a production of Sherpa Search, an executive search firm specializing in the tech industry, helping hire the right people for expert and managerial positions, and advising how to build and develop long-lasting, high-performing IT teams. If you would like to learn more, reach out to us at maciej.szczerba at sherpasearch.tech or visit our website sherpasearch.tech. See you next time.